Thank you very much for inviting me. It's quite uh, interesting to be the last speaker, particularly if you're hyperactive and you have to wait five hours. Uh, the good news about it is that uh, there is a psychological effect, there is a recency effect, they remember what you say. The bad thing is that half the people are half asleep, so I'll try to generate some action here. Um, Last time that I was here, I was talking about evolution. Is it going on? Is it going on? How do I do that? Okay, last time, thank you. Last time uh, I was talking about evolution, I was talking about different monkeys. I was talking about the gorilla and said that half of us have the genetics of the uh, alpha male gorilla and are very aggressive. And, the, uh, and then I reminded you that there is another monkey, the bonobos, the hippie monkey, the ones that love. And we have also their genetics. So fear, I want to talk to you about fear and then I'll move on. Fear is generally um, a, a threat response that is uh, generated from the brain and it produces also an hormone that called oxytocin. And oxytocin is a hormone that gets us connected but we are only connected to the one we are close to. So the problem is that we are close to the ones that are like us, and on the other hand, we are negative towards those who are not like us, and that creates discriminatory tendencies and prejudice. And we did some testing on that in Israel, um, and it was very hard to hear about the bombing that we did, the Israelis also. I said, oh my God, you know, that must be difficult. But anyway, the point is, when you are under threat, and when you develop post-traumatic symptoms, you tend to be more discriminatory. And that's what happened to people. So they move closer to the ones that are close to them and far away from the others. But I want to introduce to you Martin Neumuller. And this is how I want to start my talk. Uh, Martin Neumuller was a uh, pastor, a Lutheran pastor during the Nazi regime. And he was a nationalist and uh, a supporter of Adolf Hitler. In, during the Nazism. But it goes to say that some people changed their mindset. Eventually, during the war, he um, decided to go against it. He was arrested. And he put together one of the most important poems that I want to start with, and this will be my take-home message for you. So, first they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I was a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was, trade, I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak. And I think this is an extremely important poem that points to the fact that we, as human beings, need to be aware of the misery of others because it can come to ourselves. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, factors that leads to prejudice, and I will contend that it's a very difficult thing to change. Um, as I said last time when I was here, let's not be naive. People can do horrible things, and we know it through history. It could be a wonderful thing, and I'll be optimistic. I'm going to take a meal message and try to be optimistic in the end. I'll show you a few uh, very important programs that we did in Israel that seem to be having hope, and um, uh, share with you some of the results. So basically, uh, one of the reasons people are uh, so prejudicial is because there is a kin selection. You're closer to one like you. And we are propelled to do it from the days we were in the jungle. We all connected to the one who are close to us. And we have the same brain. And I tell people, you don't choose the brain. Your brain was chosen about 10 million years ago. But your responsibility is to change your brain. But you're going to be propelled to be against the one who are not like you. You don't have a choice in the matter. It's pre-programmed in us. We can change it, though. The other point is that there is a social identity theory that suggests that our self-esteem is collected to the group that we are belonging to. So our self-esteem propelled us to the group that is close to us. 
and reject those who are not like us. So it's a natural tendency because we sort of raise ourselves this way. Then there is the contact theory which I'll build on, which the idea is that sometimes we are having prejudice, we are not familiar with people. And when we get familiarized with them, when we know them, as I forget your name, the speaker, two speakers before me talked about, it's, it's you get closer. But I will also mention, and I will tell to you, that I've been in many dialogue groups. And though during these three days that you mentioned, we get very close to each other, but the point is, two points, later on it goes away. And the worst thing is that sometimes we say, those who are in the group are very nice. You're a nice Palestinian, you're a nice Jew, but the rest of them are not like you, and that's the problem. And I relate to that when I'll talk about the problem that we developed. The second one, the uh, fourth point is information. We learn it from the media, we learn from parents, we seep in osmosis this prejudicial from society. So that's another way that we get prejudiced and we exclusionary. And the last point is some of us get exclusionary because we don't have enough skills, cognitive skills, empathy, perspective taking. Now, why do I lay all this perspective? Because I'm going to show you what we've done with the program to take all these elements. And I believe if you are fighting, combating prejudice, you need to do a multi-theoretical approach. You need to take a lot of factors, put them together, because otherwise things will not change. All right. Can the wolf dwell with a lamb and the leopard down with a young goat? This is Isaac. Um, I don't know. Possibly. Is it possible that uh, some of us will be like this, racial um, discrimination will get away? Or is it possible that ethnic things will get away? I'm going to show you two programs that have been very effective, and luckily enough, we had followed them a long time, and now we're trying to bring them to Germany with the ethnic tension that is there. I was just invited a week ago. I want to show you the results, and the results are dramatic. And I think if you do the right things, you can do a, a, a significant change. And my point today is, yes, it's very difficult to change people's opinion, but you can do it if you work long term, and if you're very endurant, you stick, stick to that. So, the program that is called Class Exchanges in Israel was set by three types of intervention. And I'm not going to go into long details because I don't have the time, but I want to point the three main factors that change people's mind. This is students, by the way. First is group intervention with mixed group. We put the two class, uh, the, uh, it was the six classes, but we put mixed groups together and they got to uh, know each other and to uh, be content with each other. But, as Alport said, Gordon Alport, that talked about contact theory, there has to be four, at least, optimal condition. They have to be equal. How do we equalize things between Palestinians and Israelis, or Jews? They're not equal, by definition. So what we did is, we had them speak two languages together, present the Arabic language as well, and we had Palestinian and Israeli uh, facilitator. Second, we want them to cooperate, so many of the tasks were cooperative. We want the authorities to approve of that, so the parents were there present while they did it, and the principal were there. And then the most important factor, by the way, one of the most important factors for prejudice rejection is friendship. Not only friendship in a direct way, even if I know that others are friends of the other guy, if you knew that there were some Syrian uh, you, that your best friend has a Syrian friend, chances are you're going to be less prejudicial to a Syrian. So his friendship is a very important component. So the first thing, set of uh, intervention that we put is mixing the group and doing all this artistic activity. By the way, art, because art is an international language, there is no specific language. Second, this is more what uh, Emil talked, uh, uh, the uh, stereotype threat. What we did is, an homo homogeneous group, their homeroom teachers, taught them about the biases that they have. And what we did is, uh, the, uh, they would go into their classes and we would explain to them why they do what they do, how they see things, show them research, show them data, and in that sense they change the way in which they attribute to, uh, you know, facts to other people. So we did that. And the third type of intervention is then this is very unusual because few people do it, is taught them compassion and empathy. 
The two things, one is was mentioned by Phil Zimbardo is mindfulness. I'll talk more about it. So I have a program with a Dalai Lama and I'll tell you what it is. Mindfulness is essence, change the way the brain function. And the second one is perspective taking. So we taught them how they uh, judge other. We gave them skills and then we mixed them together so they'll know each other. And this is the results. Uh, we took uh, 331 students, half of them were in the experimental group and half of them in the control. The control was the Ministry of Education Tolerance uh, Program. This was a bit of a problem because we showed that what we did is right and the motor ministry do is not so right, but we had to do something. Uh, then uh, we randomized them, we randomized the classes and we did three follow-up and this, uh, two, uh, three measures and this is really important before the program, at the end of the program, and a year after. And this is what I want to say also. We heard about a lot of experiments in social psychology. Many of the experiments uh, do not do a follow-up. You can change people for a while, but if you don't come after a year, and there are so many factors in life that come on, that all of a sudden things change. So I wanted to see what happened with this student, so the third, fourth grade student, after a year. And we were lucky or unlucky, depending how you see it, because the, after a year, there was the war in Gaza. Now, I was sure that after the war in Gaza, things will be worse, because obviously we know that when there is this breakage of situation, kids get worse in their opinion of the other, etc. But we measured that anyway. So anyway, we measured uh, how they see the other, the cognitive stuff, uh, how they feel about the other, the emotional stuff, Readiness for contact, do you want to learn uh, with the others? Do you want to get them to uh, play with? Do you want to invite them to your home? And then discriminatory tendencies, this is not a measure I'll describe now, but we asked them if you were to invite them, would you invite this guy or this guy? The other thing that we did, which is very interesting, is we didn't look only on, uh, when we measure, we didn't look only Arab Jewish. We brought to the play another guy, which was Ethiopian Jew. An Ethiopian Jew is black, as you know. So what we wanted to see is, if they get closer to each other, would that generalize to another group, although we didn't touch it at all. Talk about it in a second. So here's the measures. This is the uh, uh, stereotyping. This, the green is the, uh, what we did, the uh, experimental group, and this is a control. As you see, there is a significant reduction but when we come after the year, after the war, there was a bit of change in the experimental, but not significant, but look at the change here. This shows you that when you have a war and you have a difficult situation, things will change dramatically after the situation. So my prediction is that the Roma people in Budapest will be more stereotyped now that the Syrians are coming. And I think it's not going to be surprising to me as we see the people who did not get any intervention, both Jews and uh, Palesti Israeli Palestinian, they went up in their stereotyping. Same thing was with the positive attitude towards the others. So you see in the group, there is a shoot up of the positive in the group that we did. Same thing like this, but look what happened after the war. Very negative attitude with a control group, but what we did went down, but not significantly, okay? And the last thing that I want to show is the willingness to meet and to interact, to pee, to play, to study. Again, shoot up right after the program, steady stay, but look what happened to those after the war. Went down significantly. And again, this is after the war and the significant level is pretty high. The effect size are moderate, those of you who are researcher. So this is incredible data that we show that after a year, you can train people, it's an ongoing program, it's the entire year, and you can get fantastic results. And I think if you do this kind of intervention, multi-theoretical, different level, uh, things can change. So that's the good news. Now I want to move to another program, and this is a program that is called Call to Care, and it was uh, initiated by a call from the Dalai Lama, and he says, well, we want civil ethics, we want kids to be more caring to each other. The word today is, um, you know, you talk about performance and success. Well, performance and success is not the only measure in life. We want them to be also caring for each other. So the program is based on several assumptions. First, children have an ethical and compassionate and loving constitution. 
And we can cultivate these capacities by training them. Second, care is a foundation of learning. Listen, if I'll ask you now to think about your favorite teacher. You know, I would assume that you would bring somebody who cares about you, who had given you that. Those are the teachers that you remember oftentimes. You remember also the terrible teacher for other reasons, but oftentimes this is a teacher you remember. So care is really a very important um, thing because it gives us a sense of security. It, it brings uh, the attachment figure in our life. It brings the really sense of security that we have inside and the uh, potential. Uh, so what we did is we taught both teachers and students simultaneously to be more caring using contemplative practice, mindfulness and compassion, but also emotional learning, okay? And um, we use ped pedagogical, uh, you know, uh, practices to do that. I want to show you some of the results. Um, before I do that, it is, it's very important to know that in order to give care to others, and this is not something that was mentioned up to now in the program, is you need to learn to receive care. And a lot of us are frightened to receive care. We have a lot of barriers. We need to develop self-care. It's not important only to give others. You know, when we work with teacher, we see that after about um, two, three years, about 40% of the teachers in Israel quit teaching. Why? because they don't care for themselves and the system don't care for them. The amount of, uh, you know, uh, burnout of teachers in the United States is very high. Why? Because the system doesn't care for them and they don't care for themselves. So developing self-care is extremely important. And if you work with anybody, first develop self-care, then extend your care. You cannot rule that out. So now well, this is the type of thing we did. We taught them how, why is that important, then we taught them how to do it, how to overcome obstacles in each one of the modalities, receiving care, developing care, and extending care. It's not that important, and I'm gonna skip on the basic stuff because I wanna go to the bottom of it. Uh, some of the sample of the intervention we did with the teacher. Body-oriented, the body is very important. They need to relax the body. Uh, so we did different uh, vagal breathing. Uh, maybe I'll do a vagal breathing with all of you before you leave home uh, to stimulate the, your, your vagus so your parasympathetic nervous will kick in and you'll all be relaxed and happy and stuff like this. We'll do it in the end. Uh, the other thing we did is some emotional practices. We taught them how to uh, be aware of their feeling, how to learn, uh, you know, uh, to express them verbally and somatically. We could taught them uh, cognitive skills as well, how to not criticize themselves, how to be flexible, how to have an open, gross mindset, as Carol Dweck said, and not to close themselves up. The teachers, mind you, this is not even the student. And how to have interpersonal to support each other. Very often, teachers do not support each other, so we taught them to support each other. And we taught them contemplative practices. If I have time, I will do a contemplation with you that will stimulate your part that is really, uh, you know, uh, caring. But we'll see if we have time for that. Okay, that is the adults, the teachers. Simultaneously, we got into the classes. This is a year program, and we work with the kids. Now, how do you teach kids mindfulness? How do you explain to them that they have to close their eyes or breathe or be mindful? It's very hard. So, we tell them that the brain is like a, a you know, can focus like this and can be very narrow and they can learn to, you know, stimulate the brain to be more focused. We tell them that the brain is like a puppy and they have to train their brain. We teach them to have a bubble meditation, to see something, something bad in the bubble and to burst it out, etc., etc. And we taught them ninja walk. You know ninja walk? Ninja walk. And when the ninjas are coming, you gotta be careful. So you go like this and then you go like this. So it's to be aware of your body relationship. And then we taught them also elephant yoga. You know elephant yoga? None of you does elephant yoga? It's an elephant yoga. In other words, you need to talk the kids' language. And you teach them how to be aware of themselves, how to be mindful, but not only of the self, also of the others. All right, now to the data. First of all, we had 500 students from three schools. And we randomized them as well. We had a control group as well here. And we had a lot of measures. I don't want to get into that, but I'll show you some of the results. We have a measure for the 
teachers and we have a measure for the student and we did some executive function, this is fancy uh, computerized uh, work to see what changes in the brain, etc., etc. Objective measure, uh, grades, uh, behavioral program, etc. Let me show you the result. They, this is really neat. What we asked them, this is something I wanted to know. I wanted to see if people change. So I said to the teacher, listen, I got a lot of money and I want all the kids to stay after school to pack packages for the poor kids in the neighborhood. And what I want is for you to go out of the class and we give them a chance to um, lose their free time, you know, because in Israel many of the kids after school go to different fun activities, you know, practices and karate and all the things. Can they lose it for a week and instead work very hard just for the people? So we gave them the task and they wrote uh, as if they, uh, you know, uh, without them knowing that we know who wrote what, uh, you know, we asked them to rate whether they want to stay, and about 30% of all the classes say that ah, without willing to give up their free time during the week and work for the poor. Then in the end we said to them, well, we're sorry, but the um, person who contributed for this uh, uh, was unable to come, and so we'll do it some other time. And then in the end, we did the same thing. So we saw the differences in willingness to contribute from before and after. Now I'm going to show you some of the results. This is the teacher results. So what we notice here is the personal distress, the teacher, after they practice the contemplative practices and the social learning, uh, the left one is the, uh, you know, uh, before and this is after. This is call to care and this is a control. See how the reduction and it's a very significant level. Actually, it's an amazing significant level. And see how the teacher's sense of efficacy, meaning how effective they felt as teacher, went up in the control and the uh, experimental, while in the control it's the same thing. What else did we see? Self-compassion. They became more compassionate. Look at these. Teacher became more compassionate after the program. In the control, no difference. Same as perceived stress. Stress went down, stress stayed the same. So this is just the teacher, and now the results of the students. And I'll get back to the results of something that you would be surprised we didn't measure directly in a second. So we wanted to see if they're, whoop, we wanted to see if they're more mindful, and indeed they are significantly more mindful. Look at their level of significance and the amazing results. So they learn to be a lot more talkative. The, the funny thing is that people tell us that they use uh, ninja walk to sneak at night and to go to the refrigerator. This is great. They look at different things. They smell the roses. They do different things, but they can become more mindful. In terms of attention, and this is really interesting also, look at the attention level, you know. Uh, this is uh, attention problem, rather. Attention problem went down significantly in our group. In the control group, it stayed the same. Other measure. Look. And all the measure essentially anxiety level, perceived stress, somatization, degree of somatic complaints that they have, well-being, all of them significant changes. Look at the results. So, but then we wanted to see how they perceive the other. Would they be different, although we didn't touch attitudes toward Arabs, but we wanted to see whether just the fact that they are more empathetic, more mindful, more compassionate, towards each other, would they be more compassionate to an out-member uh, group, to the Arabs? So, we use the same measure in the first result, and look what happened to them. Willingness to interact with Arabs went up, we did not touch it, we did not talk about Arabs, went up significantly compared to the control group. Negative thoughts about the Arab went down. Emotional prejudice went down. No difference in the control. So what we see essentially, if you give them these skills, the compassion and the mindfulness skills, this naturally start to work on, um, you know, attitude toward ad group member. Uh, and they also were nicer to their own classmates and to the teacher, more attached to the teachers. This is some of the exercise that we did with the parents as well. Now, this is, to me, one of the most exciting things. This is the objective measure, the willingness to, 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 to um, intervene for the poor. So you see here, um, you know, a consistent non-volunteer that went down. 
In, in our uh, group, they went down, the non-volunteer, but the volunteer went up. So this is our group. So see how many, about 30 to 40% more kids were willing to volunteer and to stay and give up their time. This is what you call a heroic thing because you sacrifice your own time. You're not at risk, but you're willing to give up your own time. And the final thing is some objective measure. This is test of coordination, and we saw also very strong significance in test of coordination. So anyway, this program is now down in 12 countries around the world, and I hope that it's going to be in Germany as well, because the point is we need to get our kids to be more caring, more uh, interested in the others. Now, I want to end up with uh, this fellow. Do you know any... You know Pablo? Pablo Nurieta, the uh, Chilean poet. I started with poem, and I'm going to end up poem. And what's nice is I see I have four minutes, which is great. Usually I take more time. And if I finish before time, this is amazing. So Paul Norieta has a poem. There's a Nobel Prize. And this is his poem, and I want to read it to you. Now we will count to 12, and we will keep all, and we will all keep still. For once, on the face of the earth, it's not to speak in any languages. Let's stop for a second. This is mindful also. And not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engine. We'd be all together in a sudden strangeness. It is strange to be together. Those who prepare green wars, wars in gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivor, would put a clean, on clean uh, clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. Now I'll kind up to 12, and you'll keep quiet, and I will go. Thank you very much.